to read the names into the record for, okay, you, you'll be able to pull it for your records or your minutes. Thank you. All right. So uh, it is, uh, as I say, it's 630. I'd like to call this regular, excuse me, this meeting of the Board of Trustees of the City Employees Retirement Fund and the Board of Trustees of the Police and Firemen's Pension Fund order. For the record, today is Wednesday, September 6, 2023. Uh, and before we jump into the um, agenda, could we kindly stand and pledge the flag? Okay, item number one on the agenda, I will entertain a motion by the Board of Trustees for the city's City Employment Retirement Fund and the Board of Trustees of the Police and Firemen Pension Fund to approve the minutes of the regular joint meeting held March 6, 2023. Do you have a motion? Second. Thank you, Councilman Minichia, seconded by um, Board of Safety Commissioner Coxwell. Um, questions or comments on those minutes? Hearing none, I'll call the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? This motion carries. All right, item two uh, is in two parts, A and B. Uh, the first is a presentation from the Municipal Employees Retirement Fund and Police and Firemen's Pension Plan by Steve Lemansky of Hooker Holcomb. Uh, Mr. Lemansky is participating via Zoom. Uh, Good evening. Hi, Steve. And I, is there any way we can put Steve front and center to, or are we all looking at him as a tile on our, we're gonna try some technical stuff, Steve, while you're waiting. Okay. <laughs> there you are. All right. All right, I'm hey. turning this over to you. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, if, I, if I may share my screen, if that's okay. Okay. So good evening. Um, we are uh, going to be talking about tonight the uh, most recent actuarial valuation for both the Municipal Employees Retirement Fund and the Police and Firemen's Pension Plan. Uh, these are as of July 1st, 2022. Um, these, these are valuations are done every other year, as you probably know. Um, have an agenda in front of you the uh, bullet points that I'll be talking about tonight, just a reminder of the purpose of the valuation, um, an overview of the results since last time around, talk about uh, the assumptions that we looked at, and go through some detail on the city's contribution, otherwise known as the ADEC. I'll explain that in a moment. Um, some information on the assets and the investment return assumption, and then thoughts for next time around. So um, as a reminder, I go through this, I think every time, but I think it's important in terms of what the valuation represents and does not represent in the life of the pension plan. Um, the box here, the kind of the gold box in the middle of the slide um, is always true over the life of the plan. And when we talk about the city's ultimate cost of the plan, um, what that means is cash contributions made by the city over the life, the whole life of the um, fund from when it started until the last retiree uh, dies. And so that money going in um, by definition needs to equal the money going out, i.e. the uh, benefits paid to retirees, any expenses incurred that are paid out of the fund. Um, this is generally true, but however, um, the, the money is not under the mattress, so to speak, it's being invested, it's being invested in equities, fixed income, real estate, all, all sorts of investments. And that's expected to earn a rate of return over the long term. And that rate of return that's earned by the fund reduces dollar for dollar the city's ultimate cost. And um, of course, employees are by contract making uh, contributions as a percentage of their pay while they're working. And those contributions also uh, work towards funding the plan. But this is true um, over the life of the plan. And the, what the valuation does 
is assign a portion of that long-term cost to the budget year, meaning the upcoming budget year. Um, and so the valuation itself does not determine the ultimate cost of the plan, but merely is an sort of allocation to the current year in terms of costs. I mentioned ADEC a couple moments ago, that's short for actuarial, actuarially determined employee contribution, which um, in English is the city's contribution for the upcoming year. There are two pieces to that. There's an amortization of any unfunded liability. Think of that um, kind of analogy as like the mortgage of the pension plan being paid off over time. So that's being paid off right now over 20 years. And the normal cost, which is the current cost of benefits uh, that the active members who are still in the plan are expected to accrue in the current year. So that's the current cost to, to stay current on their accrual and then a payment against the unfunded liability. So um, the last couple of years were, were certainly interesting prior to 2022, particularly on the investment side. I'll go through that in a moment. But when the dust settled, when we compare the what's called the funded ratio of the plan, which I'll go through the details of that in a few minutes, assets against liabilities, um, for both plans, both the city plan, city employees and police and fire, uh, those ratios are up slightly from 2020 and a higher ratio, ratio is a good thing. It means that a higher percentage of the liabilities being currently covered by the assets in the fund. So it, it was up uh, just over one percentage point for the city plan and about three percentage points for the police and fire plan since the 2020 valuation. And um, the city's contribution or the ADEC for fiscal 23-24 was slightly lower for both plans. So in total, it was about 5.78 million this time around versus 5.85 million. And you can see the details um, on the screen for the two plans. Both plans are, came down a little bit. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, on the investment side um, of the equation, it's it's kind of a tale of two years. And I, and I have a, a few slides in that go through the details, but if you think back to fiscal year in 21, you'll see in a moment that that was by any measure a fantastic year in the market. Um, and fiscal 22 was the opposite of that. So those two years largely offset each other. Um, not totally because on average, a market value basis um, against the assumption, which is currently 6.75% per year, that's what the assumed rate of return is, it averaged out to just under 4% per year. Um, and as you'll see, and as you might recall, um, we use a smoothing method, just like virtually every um, public sector pen pension plan in the country does, that, that um, kind of smooths out the ups and downs of the market in terms of the short-term impact on the fund and the funded ratio. So because there were some large gains that had not been fully recognized in prior years, when those were reflected against phasing and the loss that happened in the most recent year, the return was actually slightly better than the assumption. And that helped, that helped keep these funded ratios actually um, improve them slightly in the short term versus last time around. On the liability side, um, liabilities came in a little higher than projected for both plans for different reasons. Police and fire, uh, the actual salary increases were a little higher than assumed. And on the city side, fewer retirees uh, died than we expected. So when people are, are living longer than expected, that means the liability um, is not tracking, uh, it's not coming down quite as much for the people in payment status. So that created a lot, what we call a loss on the on the liability side. Just as we've been doing um, the last several years, this is just a, a continuation of the standard approach in terms of what's called the mortality projection scale. Uh, we use two assumptions. One, the mortality table, which think of that today on the valuation date, it's predicting the probability say that a retiree age 65 may die this year, but 
the projection scale says, well, what's what's what do we expect to happen 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Because we know that mortality in terms of um, lifespans and things like that does not stay static um, due to uh, advances in technology, medical, medicine, and so forth. That's expected to improve over time. So those mortality rates down the road, um, those get those get trued up every year. There's a study done by the Society of Actuaries and they kind of tweak that assumption. So we picked up the most recent scale, relatively modest impact about actually less than two tenths of a percent overall um, that increased the liability. And as you know, and just a reminder, both plans are closed to new hires. These plans kind of in uh, the universe of public sector plans are what we call mature. Um, there are um, pretty heavy concentration, both in terms of headcounts and liability for uh, members that are no longer actively working for the city. So in the case of the city plan, that's about 70% of the liability is with that group and police and fire about 64%. Any questions on kind of the general results before we move into some of the details? Any questions? No questions. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we did look at the, the two things that we looked at, uh, that we look at every every time around, and these are for your fund, the most important things in terms of um, predicting the liabilities over the long term are the investment rate of return based on the asset allocation of the funds. Um, we did not recommend a change this year. Um, that's that is different from previous valuations, and it's different from the trend overall in the public sector space. Um, because of increases in interest rates and more favorable prospective uh, outlooks on asset returns over the long term, the expected rate of return um, that's generated by our model and by your investment consultant, at least on the valuation date, um, continue to support the assumption. So no change there. Um, we believe that that continues to be reasonable. The trend overall, based on the survey that we prepare um, every year that you might have seen, is a general lowering of that assumption versus what it had been. You know, you look back 10, 15 years ago, 8%, for example, was a very common assumption. But uh, six and three quarters for your fund is, re is reasonable. The average for all Connecticut public sector plans, this excludes the state plan, Any, anything sponsored by the state is 6.53%, but um, those results do depend on the size of the fund as, as, as a kind of overall trend. The larger the fund, the higher uh, the assumed rate of return, they generally have a wider variety of investments to, um, to select from. Um, they may get more favorable fee arrangements and so forth, but those those rates tend to be a little bit higher. Um, the average for Connecticut plans with 50 million or more in assets is 6.86. So you're actually still slightly conservative relative to uh, what I call more of your peer group, the larger size uh, public sector plans. I already talked about uh, the mortality projection scale. One thing that I didn't mention, um, you know, normally we would have picked up a 2022 scale, the, that's how these are named. They're named by the year in which they were published. The Society of Actuaries for the first time did not publish an update in 2022. The reason for that is due to uh, the COVID era data and the way that more recent experience gets weighted in that analysis. Um, it was determined by the committee that works on those, um, those scales that, that kind of the trend over the last couple of years during that era would have unduly influenced um, what long-term trends might look like. And the jury's still out, um, you know, going to the actuarial conferences and, and reading some of the literature on it. Even today, there's um, debate on what those long-term trends might be. So they kind of punted on that for 2022. I expect um, that they probably will do an update this year. Um, that generally comes out at the end of October. And if that does get updated, of course, we will uh, we would recommend and um, reflecting that for the next time around. But no change there. In terms of how the um, ADEC or the city's contribution was developed, this is the city plan. 
municipal employees and side by side comparison, this valuation, which is 2022 versus the previous one. Uh, as I mentioned, no change the assumptions. I think the key numbers here are the assets of the plan against the liability, right? So as of that date, rough, again, this is not an actuarial value. So there's some smoothing here. It may, it's not going to match the market, but at that time, 44.8 million roughly and assets against 54.9 million and li accrued liability. So based on service to date. So the unfunded liability or mortgage of plan, if you will, is just over $10 million as of that day. Again, that's being paid off over 20 years now. And if you can divide these numbers, the, the asset divided by the liability, that's how they get to the 81.5%. So that's, a, that's an improvement versus 2020. And in terms of how the contribution itself is developed, here's the two pieces that I mentioned on the first slide. So you got the normal cost, that is uh, for your active members, one year's worth of benefit accrual. So the, those members are working one more year. Um, generally speaking, their pay is expected to go up. So the combination of those factors, just to cover that one year worth of accrual, and then the current valuation is about 380,000. Why is it lower than last time around? Well, these plans are closed. So they're closed to new hires. There are fewer active members 2022 versus 20. So fewer members means overall um, a lower amount of benefits being accrued. This number will eventually go to zero when the last active retires. Um, and then the second piece is the mortgage payment on the unfunded liability. It's, even though the unfunded liability is roughly the same, actually slightly lower, this was being paid off over 22 years, two years ago, and now it's being paid over 20 years. So you think about taking out a home mortgage, if you had the same mortgage amount roughly, but took out a 20 year mortgage against 22, the payment's gonna be higher on the shorter mortgage. And that's where, where you're at right now. But overall, the contribution came down a bit from last time. Same slide, but police and fire, uh, the details are here. So the numbers are different, of course, Higher assets and liabilities generally. Um, this plan's funded ratio is not as high, but that's been the case for a number of years, as far as I'm aware. But it is improving. Um, this, again, this is being funded over 20 years. So the idea is to um, kind of drive or point this ratio towards 100% now over a 20 year period. So it's going to be an incremental change. Um, but the idea is if, if, the assets earn what's expected if the liabilities track as expected based on the assumptions and the city contributes the actuarial contribution, which it has been, then this ratio will eventually get to 100%. The assets will fully cover the liabilities. Again, slight, slight decrease in normal costs, um, same as the city plan. Any questions on the details of those? Um, calculations. I know I covered a lot there in a couple minutes in terms of how we determine the contribution. Scanning the room for you. I don't see any questions. Okay. No questions. Okay. Some details on the assets. We have this exhibit for uh, 2021 and 2122 for both plans. So this is, as I mentioned earlier, so that this was, uh, you know, we love to see these sorts of returns in terms of what they do for the funded status of the plan um, and so forth, and, you know, approaching 23, 24% on a market basis for the year. You can So you can see how, for example, the city plan assets grew from 41 million to just under 49 million that year. Receipts, the breakdown between city employees totaling about 1.5 million coming in, um, about 3.4 million going out. And the, the balance, of course, of the increases in investment return. This phenomenon here, I get asked about it all the time. You know, is that a problem? Actuarially, it's not a problem. I mean, you have a negative cash flow situation, but that's just a sign that the plan is mature. You have pre-funded a lot of the benefits. Um, the investment return is expected to do a lot of the heavy lifting at this point. Um, and, it, and it did a lot of that in fiscal 21. You, can, you know, the numbers right here on the screen show that. 
Um, so it, it is something that I'm sure your investment consultant looks at closely. You can speak to that um, you know, better than I can in terms of what they look at in terms of asset allocation, because you have to be aware of liquidity needs, right? You want to make sure that you have cash, sort of a plan um, to fund those benefits as they come due, have a little bit set aside in cash so that you're not selling off equities um, just because you have to in terms of meeting those monthly payments. But this in and of itself is not an issue actuarially. It's kind of, it's to be expected at this point um, in the life cycle of these plans. 21, 22, um, same exhibit, just different numbers. Of course, the opposite result in terms of against the assumptions. So about negative 12, negative 13%. These numbers are roughly in line with the averages that we saw out there in Connecticut in the public sector space, right? So the cash flows are similar, just, you know, the, the negatives here instead of the large positives the previous year. But these are the details that are underlying the summary results I talked about in the first couple of slides. Um, I, I feel that it's important to go over this because there's sometimes questions or confusion about how we determine that smooth value of assets, the actuarial value of ass assets that I mentioned before. How do they get reconciled? So again, for the city plan, and I've got the same, a similar um, slide for the police and fire. But we uh, we start with the market value. So this is what the market value was on the valuation date. And every year we keep track of um, what those what those returns look like relative to the assumption. So in this the last couple of years, it, that assumption has been six and three quarters. So for 21, 22, um, the return was, $9.34 million less than an assumed rate of return of six and three quarters. So mm -hmm. that doesn't get fully reflected. We re You're using four-year smoothing. So 25% of that gets reflected. There's 75% left. And then we keep track of that every year. This kind of a rolling thing until all these, they, they each roll off over four years. But we keep track of them. So on the valuation date, you had a $7 million unrecognized loss for 22, a three and a half million gain and about $400,000 gain left from fiscal 20, or excuse me, loss. Um, when you add these together, we're still we're st still keeping track of about a $4 million unrecognized loss. Now this will eventually flow through to the assets that are used for valuation purposes, but not yet. So, We've got those losses not yet reflected. So in this case, in the short term, the actual value is, is greater than market. Um, if we see, you know, I, I believe last time around, it was the opposite. There was an unrecognized um, gain. So that's how we get to that number um, in terms of the smoothing technique that's used. Same, same thing for police and fire. Um, so I won't, I won't cover that. The numbers are different. Uh, but the same methodology. Um, in terms of the investment return assumption and what we look at and does it still, can, do we believe it's still reasonable? On the valuation date, these were the target asset, asset allocations by class. So for example, uh, we've got large cap equities, mid small cap equities, international bonds, real estate, and so forth. So if we look at developed international equities, for example, the target asset allocation is 17.5%. Of course, that varies over time from year to year, depending what's happening in the market, but we're looking at the long-term, so we always look at the target. And then um, using our model, on what, what we believe, or our outlook on the expected real rate of return over the long term, so this is this is return a return above and kind of over and above inflation. The idea is that um, part of the reason you invest in equities and real estate and fixed income is you want to get right. The way I say it is, you want to get paid for the little bit of the risk you're taking, right? Risk return, risk uh, return, reward, that sort of thing. Um, 
So the, this is really the premium above inflation. We take a weighted average, do a lot of math here in terms of what this combination looks like and what's it expected to return above inflation, 4.26. The long-term inflation expectation is still 2.4. You know, Steve, how do you get that? Inflation has been way higher than that short term. Yes, that's right. Absolutely. But it's, these are long-term looks over 30, 50, 75 year horizons. Um, typically we are using social security's long-term look. That's that's the, um, the assumption that's in their trustees report that comes out every year that is used to project the solvency of social security and Medicare and those funds. That still has not changed. Um, I was a little surprised by that this year that it didn't change in 2023. But um, they did have commentary in the report because I think a lot of people had, this, had, had the same question, but um, they believe that although there might be short-term shocks to the system like, we're, like we've been experiencing recently over the long term, um, they still maintain 2.4. Um, some a number of the investment return investment consulting firms out there have tweaked up their assumptions slightly. This is, if anything, slightly conservative. So, you know, if 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 based on your asset allocation, you're expected to get paid 4.26 percent above inflation, and inflation is expected to be 2.4. This is what we're coming out with as a raw kind of a raw output of the model, which. With rounding, it's real. It's the same in our view because these are not perfect, right? These are kind of looking out to the future based on judgment and models, but it's close. It's close enough in this situation, certainly, to support six and three quarters percent in our opinion. And if inflation were expected to be higher, um, these returns might change. But if we kind of keep them the same for sake of this argument, that would support an even higher rate of return. So that's a lot of uh, a lot of detail and analysis of what we do and how we look at this and and how we make a judgment call. In our opinion, it you know what is what does the rate of return look like for this fund? Is it still reasonable? This is in the report and um, just walk through kind of how we look at things. Um, for two thousand twenty four. Um, again, this it's this is not implying that there's an issue with it. It's just something that we feel is con, is important to continue to look look at, particularly in light of some of the changes in the capital markets the last couple of years. Um, so we just put that on there as a reminder. Um, I think your funding policy is sound. The um, twenty year period now is is within the recommended range of 15 to 20 years, best practices. So um, I'm comfortable with that in terms of um, what the city's doing. And um, the funded status did stay stable and the contribution stayed stable, actually decreased slightly, um, even though the markets were really volatile over the last couple of years. So that's my formal presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So thank you, Steve. Um... And I know that we have over the last, at least over the last 10 years, I think we reduced that rate of return a couple of times, sure. but, uh, but we're, your recommendation is that we, um, we stick with the 6.75 at this point for, for, for this valuation. Yes. Okay. For this valuation period. Okay. All right. To the floor. Are there questions? And I know even to the um, audience, I see um, fire department is here. Any questions? Nothing. Council? No questions? Board of Safety? Thank you. All right. I guess another stellar presentation stumped the panel here. <laughs> so, all right. I appreciate that. And thank you again, Steve, for all of your work um, with us in regard to um, getting our audit done and uh, that other settlement matter that we had to deal with. Greatly appreciate Glad your Glad to be of help. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Um, getting on in our agenda, item 2B, a presentation for the Police and Firemen's Pension Fund and City Employees Retirement Fund by uh, Anthony Trangisi of Fiducient Advisors. And do you want to step up to the podium?
Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so I will walk through the first part of the report and my colleague, Chris Cashmar, will, will do the second part of the report. Um, I'll keep it relatively brief, um, but happy to answer yeah. questions if you're going to more detail on any topics that you might see here. Okay. Um, the first section here on your screen, we have our governance calendar, and this, this is the second quarter review. So we'll be looking at results and returns from the second quarter. The governance calendar topic is uh, fiduciary training and investment policy statement review. So behind, hope I can get the page to work. Um, the next page shows the investment policy statement. Oh. Okay, thanks. Um, as you all know, there's uh, uh, the investment policy statement in place for each of the plans. The documents are essentially uh, identical to each other. The investment policy statement is the guiding document that oversees uh, or that explains the oversight of the uh, portfolio. So it discusses the topics listed on the screen here, investment objective, responsibilities, whose job is it to do what, the asset allocation framework, which is important. We talk about that at all of our meetings with you, rebalancing guidelines, selection criteria for managers and termination, as well as proxy voting. The documents were originally put into place in 2015. Uh, has been updated through the years as the asset allocation has changed. The last page of the document is the asset allocation target and ranges. Uh, so that's been updated periodically. Uh, we do think it's good practice uh, for perhaps both groups to um, reaffirm these documents, whether that be today or at, a, uh, at the next meeting. Um, we think kind of good fiduciary practice would be to uh, take a moment and review and, and again, approve those documents. Although we have no recommendations for changes, which is rather standard for an investment policy statement, um, not going to change your, your approach or your objective very frequently. So I'll skip, see if I can skip through a, a bunch of pages here. I think uh, hopefully everybody receives these reports electronically. If not, we'll be happy to, to send them uh, directly to anyone, and, and perhaps we can have it on the agenda for the next meeting if, if you don't want to approve them today. Uh, and, and let me just finish here. As I mentioned um, on the screen, we have the target asset allocation. And at the meeting in March, uh, where actually my colleague Chris presented uh, some asset allocation targets, changes were made. And that's reflected on this Appendix A. Uh, and right, in the, uh, right at the top of the page, you can see as of March 2023. So that's in your minutes when you approve those changes. And, and we marry those minutes to what's reflected in this, the investment policy statement over the years. Any questions or thoughts on the investment policy statement? Great. And, and I'll finish um, this part of the report with a review of committee or board best practices. Uh, we put this in the report each quarter, and I, I won't belabor it, but just to say I think uh, these groups exhibit the characteristics that are reflected uh, or that are uh, exhibited here or reflected on this page, uh, which show good fiduciary practice. You meet regularly, you review the portfolios on a regular basis, you meet with your actuary on a regular basis and um, uh, tie the objectives together with what's being done in the portfolio, document all of those processes. And you can see at the bottom of the page, we make mention to the investment policy statement, which you've had in place for a number of years. And again, uh, we think it makes good sense to, to review that and, and reaffirm it on a regular basis. Any questions before we move forward and review the portfolio? It's a rated right Good evening, folks. Good to see you again. Chris Cashmore from Fiducian Advisors. Our colleague at Tony's, I think I was here last March, as some of you may remember. Uh, I think the intention, we'll just spend a couple of minutes very quickly catching you up on what's going on in markets here today. It has been a pretty good year and a constructive year for investing, and uh, your portfolios uh, reflect that, as we'll see momentarily and catch up on the allocations and kind of under the hood a little bit what's going on in terms of individual managers and how things have worked out. So the page you see here, uh, page 26, is a busy one, admittedly. But anyway, what I'd leave you with just at a very high level is a couple of points. Um, front and center for investors year to date, right, has continued to be grappling with what the Federal Reserve's done with interest rates. How far along are they? How much more may they do? And they get in rates at a level that does, in fact, bring inflation back down. 
and do so in a manner that doesn't uh, generate a recession, right? That's the balancing act that they've been trying to strike. And the way markets have reacted to date, by and large, people think that they are going to, in fact, pull that off. And we're of that camp as well, that even if we do get a little bit of an economic slowdown, it in all likelihood would be a mild one and, and one that probably wouldn't be too um, a debilitating to asset class returns. So there's a bit that, that's basically the takeaway on the page here. Uh, the other thing of note, um, while equity returns are very good, they are concentrated again. So as you've probably read and, and seen uh, in, in various reports, uh, there are six or seven very large cap names in the U.S. in particular that have been really the drivers of the good performance you've seen more broadly. Um, but nonetheless, it, it has been um, a good year for uh, for investing. Uh, so on page 28, you'll see here uh, a lot of detail. The top half of the page gives you uh, perspectives both year to date, the vertical bars there that you see for the first six months of the year ending in June. Uh, and then you see the encircled numbers, which are the, the second quarter results uh, in isolation. And again, kind of just piecing it together is mentioned a pretty good year, right? You see there uh, uh, in the middle of the exhibit there, almost 17% returns for large company stocks here in the U.S., but uh, a decent returns elsewhere around the world as well. Um, and moreover, uh, year to date as well, better and stabilizing fixed income returns, right? You'll remember in calendar year 2022, we had that awful double whammy. Not only were equity returns down dramatically, but interest rates were up and fixed income returns were down. And there really wasn't anywhere to kind of deflect that pain. Year to date, we've had the opposite scenario, right? So we've had decent returns on both sides of the ledger. Steve made mention of it briefly for fixed income investing going forward. In fact, we actually think the outlook is pretty good, right? We have much higher rates today than we had 20 months ago. And over time, that should result in better fixed income returns. Before we shift to the portfolios, anything from folks just on big picture? economic markets, indices, any thoughts, comments? No, just stop me if something arises, but that's the takeaway just we wanted to uh, emphasize for the uh, uh, for the, the committees. So let's shift over here if we could to just outcomes for the portfolios. Uh, we'll start on page 34 with the uh, the employee plan. So you see here at the end of June, about $45.4 million of invested assets um, and allocations that are by and large, if you look at the two columns in the middle of the exhibit there, pretty close target to actual rate, right? And I think as we've talked in the past, you'll remember that's by design, right? So when we're working with Dan in the city and we need to raise monies or invest monies, we're always working alongside your long-term strategic allocation so they don't get too far off off of um, those target weights. So I think we're in pretty good working order in the employee plan from an allocation standpoint. No recommendations for the, the committees this evening. I would note here, just for the record, no actions required, but our research teams have elevated two of the fixed income strategies um, to different ratings uh, in the system. I'm sure Tony has described to you in the past. Um, the MetWest total return strategy you see there at the top uh, uh, portion of the exhibit um, has been elevated to watch status. There are some fairly meaningful changes that are occurring with the team that runs those monies on the city's behalf. Our research team's in very close contact uh, with their colleagues at MetWest. Again, no action just yet for the committees to contemplate, but we wanted to highlight for you that it is on an elevated status. And then Brandywine, another one of your fixed income managers you see there in the middle of the exhibit, uh, elevated to discuss status. And discuss, if you were a members, uh, this, an occurrence that's happened with the strategy, but not something that we think ultimately will prove to uh, uh, be a challenge in terms of that strategy, our conviction in that strategy longer term. So Brandywine on discuss, Met West on um, uh, watch, Again, no actions for you to take this evening. We'll obviously keep you posted in real time. The balance of the roster there that you see, all the other investments are in good working order. 
Um, and we have that maintained designation, which is our highest uh, research rating. Any questions on employee? Folks okay? Uh, let's switch over quickly on uh, to 35 here. Obviously the same exhibit for police and fire. So uh, just under $77 million, you see in the upper left-hand corner of the page of invested assets. And again, similar to what you saw with the city plan and good working order from an allocation perspective, if you look at the actual weights and, and where the target weights are. So again, no recommendations for the um, for the groups this evening. And, and obviously those two designations on the research front I just mentioned carry over um, uh, with the police and fire, but again, no action required. Anything on police and fire? Okay, and that doesn't look like it. So on page 36, awful lot of numbers on this page and we will certainly go through each and every one. Let's catch up on the highlights, however. Upper left-hand corner of the page there, you'll see, remember the plans share allocations, right? Share the manager roster. So as you would expect, right? The numbers over time are, uh, if not identical, which they typically are, are very, very close. Cash flow timing can sometimes trigger a little bit of a difference, but they don't endure. You see in the very upper left-hand corner of the exhibits there, second quarter ending June calendar quarter, up three and a half percent for each of the portfolios in line with what the benchmarks did and what the broad markets are doing. Uh, and then you see, I think an interesting and a, and a relevant number for these groups, fiscal year to date or for the period ending in June, another good year, right? So Steve obviously worked this into all his calculations going forward, but up close to 11% for both the plans for the one year period ending in June, for the fiscal year ending in June, you see there 10.8 and 10.7% and respectively. Um, and again, in the interest of time, we're not gonna go through each and every manager, but if you were inclined and look through them, you would see that you're getting good contributions from across the roster managers. So your fixed income managers collectively are adding value over the broad fixed income markets. Um, your domestic equity managers are kind of holding serve. If you look under the hood and generating some very compelling returns there, you can see, again, I won't go through them. You can read them, but some very strong double digit returns by and large. And then finally, international equity are kind of more of the same, some pretty compelling absolute and, and relative returns also. So um, I think it's a good and constructive outcome, as I mentioned on the front end, in terms of what the plans have achieved in 2Q and moreover for the fiscal year ending in June, no concerns around the larger allocation. And again, no recommendations this evening for the, the groups, but again, happy to take questions if you may have them. No questions. Folks okay? Oh, super. Okay. Good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Then um, if there are no proposed changes or updates, uh, then I guess what we can do is skip over three, four. I don't know that I need a motion to table those. We could just skip over. All right. Uh, and move into item five, uh, there being no further business before the before I call for that. Are there any general questions that the board may have? Questions? Nothing. All right. Then there being no further business before the board of trustees, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I heard count, uh, Commissioner Benedetto and Commissioner McLeod second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thanks. All right. We'll give everyone a couple seconds to clear the room. Thank you for coming in person today. I appreciate it. Welcome to stay. Good to see you all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
I know I was doing the same thing. Robin was on the call for the for the meeting. Okay. We have time for cake if anyone wants to grab a slice. I thought you were. <laughs> Did you hear him? I had these mics live. <laughs> oh. Edit that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can hear it from you. Okay, if I may uh, jump right into the regular meeting of the uh, Board of Public Safety. For the record, it is still Wednesday, September 6th, 2023. Uh, this is um, the regular meeting of the um, board and uh, all board members are present in the auditorium for this meeting. It is now 7.17 p.m. And before we uh, jump into the regular agenda, I would just um, like to um, ask the board's indulgence in offering up a, a couple of moments of silence. Uh, first for the passing of former Mayor Mary Jane Grenick. And then, of course, uh, particularly painful today because uh, we did have an opportunity, most of us, to attend the wake. Um, I would ask for a um, similar moment of silence for former Councilwoman Marie Soliani. Thank you all. We'll move into the agenda. Item number one, I will entertain a motion to open the meeting to the public for members of the public attending in person only. Oof. Thank you, Commissioner Benedetto, seconded by Commissioner Spino. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? This motion carries. Is there anyone from the public wishing to address the board? Seeing none, we'll move into item two. I'll entertain a motion to accept the special meeting minutes from July 31, 2023. So moved. Second. Thank you, Commissioner McLeod. Seconded by Commissioner Benedetto. Uh, questions or comments on the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Uh, for the record, an abstention is uh, Commissioner Cuxwell. Item three, I'll entertain a motion to accept the regular meeting minutes from August 2nd, 2023. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Benedetto. Second. Second by Commissioner Spino. Uh, questions or comments on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? And uh, for the record, extension to goes to Greg, uh, Commissioner Cuxwell. Item four, I'll entertain a motion. Actually, we don't need a motion for this. This is um, uh, a presentation on the local emergency medical services plan for the city of Torrington um, being presented to you by the fire chief. Oh, okay. Uh, as it looks see, vaguely familiar. <laughs> as you can see in front of you, this is a five-year plan yeah. um, that we've updated since uh, 2018. So most of the updates on it are just reflective of the business changes that have occurred with our MOU that we entered into Trinity uh, for an additional ambulance for our peak volume. Um, updated, obviously, a contact list of people that are on it. Um, acknowledgements, your basic statement of purpose. The authority, basically what uh, regulates this plan. I feel like I'm not going. Um, a brief history of the um, emergency response, medical response for the city of Torrington from the days of Campion to now Trinity, um, taking over and providing both BLS and ALS 
uh, transport and care for the city of Torrington, along with um, how the fire department is a supplemental responder with that within that system. Talking about the response area, the response area covers um, basically it says where we will respond, where we won't. Um, and what we do, I'll go into later on with mutual aid. Uh, also outlines the hospitals and trauma centers that we'll use based on the critical nature of um, each patient. So whether it be local to Charlotte Hungerford or transported to Waterbury or flown out to Hartford. Uh, our oversight and medical control comes from Charlotte Hungerford Hospital, both for Trinity and for um, the fire department. There's a standards and team concept that we follow to try to work together. That's outlined here. This is all part of uh, the Office of Emergency Medical Services requirement. Next page would be the inventory of the equipment that we have to carry on all of our apparatus, along with what Trinity will carry on all of their um, vehicles for transport and or response. Public safety answering point, which is uh, LCD. Uh, this basically outlines how the call comes into them what they do to EMD the call so they can um, dispatch the appropriate resources in the most timely manner. First responder uh, service is Trinity's primary and we are the backup to that. So we supplement them in doing so. And they do that via um, basic life support ambulances. And then they also provide um, a paramedic service to us. So we have two paramedics on during the peak time and one paramedic, or excuse me, three paramedics and uh, two at uh, P or uh, during the um, off times, it'll do that. Uh, mutual aid is co uh, um, covered through Trinity through agreements with our neighboring uh, partners. So when the calls um, supersede what we're able to deliver here, they're able to rely on their partners and vice versa for the other communities. The uh, factual, factual uh, response time is based on um, statistics starting in 2019 up to uh, present day. Uh, those were updated from the original plan here from 2018 to present. Um, excuse me, moving forward before all that. So these are all the, the basic response times that we have and they're all um, basically an average of what happens. A lot of that is dependent upon where resources are located within the city. So if Trinity happens to have an ambulance up at BJ's and something on the East End happens, the response time is gonna be pretty good. Um, if they happen to be at the hospital trying to restock or transfer transport, or excuse me, transfer care of a patient, Obviously, their response time is going to be um, significantly delayed. And the same goes with the fire department responding out of quarters. Um, to get up to the Upper East Side, you're looking at a 12 plus minute response time, sometimes longer if you have to go way out. The quality management part of it is just the way we look at the system. We meet quarterly um, to discuss the overall EMS plan, see if there's any faults going on with it, any adjustments we need to make during the course of the year. So it's just a follow-up to make sure that everything's going well and there aren't any issues. Um, the public education and heart safety community, which everyone I believe knows that Torrington is uh, one of those, which is a good thing for us. It means that we have um, a significant amount of AEDs placed out throughout the city. And we have a, a, an excellent relationship working with Trinity with the city to provide um, advanced life care when it comes to cardiac and things like that. Um, Future objectives of the EMS system, we're gonna to continue to monitor the performance, look at ways to improve and update um, and review with the committee periodically. And then we're looking hopefully at some point in time, get the city of Torrington to be able to get the uh, PSA uh, in place. So that's still an ongoing project. And the last is just another monitoring of the same kind of things. So if anyone has any questions. Questions? Yeah, I, Chief, I have three or four questions. Sure. To be honest with you here. Um, when it gets to the billing part, you know, it says the state can set the billing, you know, um, when Trinity makes the calls, we go out. Can we bill now? We're supplemental to that, so we don't bill. Okay. Um, if anything were to ever change and we started having a bigger footprint on it, then the opportunity would be able to look at doing bundle building, billing through uh, with Trinity. Okay. to be able to bill for certain services. Right oh. now, we have an agreement with both Trinity and Charlotte Hungerford that they replace any of our durable goods that we use. So the cost to the fire department is minimal at most. In, in the protocol and the response on page um, 10, why are we first? Let me just look so I know what I'm looking at the same thing. 
your pen. Maybe I've got the wrong page here. Page 11. I was going to say that didn't work. Uh, you, what are you referring to exactly? Well, it's got the steps of a 911 call. Yeah. So we're five. Trinity seven. This all happens within a few seconds. So what okay. basically it's, what it means is if it's, it's something that's, again, in our response profile that we would like a cardiac arrest or a seizure or something like that, the fire department's going to go along with Trinity. And again, in the times that mutual aid comes into the city, the fire department's going to respond. So in that step process, it's just really a split second thing that they're going, oh, okay, this is what we have to send for the appropriate resources. The, the only thing that bothered me about the whole thing was that we've, we've been asking for meetings about trying to um, clean up the communication between Trinity and the fire department, you know, so far as both of both ending up there and not having to be there, you know, um, and Trinity's got to go back. I guess, I, what do you do? Go back through your dispatch and by the time they get back to fire department, we're already there and we don't need to be. But I, I just was looking for that to be addressed somewhere. And, and it's a it's a future desire to uh, to address that. The problem with that is two different radio bands, and I'm not a radio person. So, in layman terms, they speak one language, we speak another, uh, and we don't have uh, radios in our vehicles that are, we can actually talk to each other without an expenditure to hmm. put those radios in the vehicles that would be here. So there's a lot more moving parts to it that hopefully we can address. Okay, but that'll be addressed. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions on the plan? Just, uh, just, you know, we talk about the PSAP and with that coming up, is this part of putting this information together? Is just something that's done on a regular basis for the emergency medical plan? Uh, it, like I said, we meet quarterly or yeah, quarterly every year um, to discuss anything that's going on with it and make those adjustments. That answer? Yeah, I, I guess um, you know, if there's future discussions about we'll have that responsibility for the primary service, and I, I'm just wondering if part of this information is when we go through that process or the PSA, you mean? Yes, or? PSA. Sorry. Um, yes, Trinity would still continue to do that. What the um, with the city looking to get um, get the licensure for the PSA, that's basically just gives the city control who is the provider. But well, we've entered into an agreement with Trinity. Um, to continue with them providing service. They're doing an excellent job. We're not looking to change any of that, but it just gives the city a little bit more control of that overall plan for the EMS and the delivery within the community. And the one that you provided to us the last time this was updated or reviewed, is this a yearly basis or how? The plan that I gave you. The one we just went through here. Not not too long ago. Well, this is a five-year plan. This is the five-year okay, plan. Correct. Yes. Yeah, the one I just gave you was the update on what uh, the presence of the fire department. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? All right. We're all set with this one then. And I know that we, we are required to file this with the state. By, yes. Is it December, the end of December or beginning of January? End of December. Okay. All right. Great job. Thank you very much. All right. Let's move into item number five. Uh, I will entertain a motion to authorize the mayor to act on behalf of the city to award, execute, and administer the purchase of the 2023 Ford Explorer XLT or equivalent uh, from Litchfield Ford of Litchfield, Connecticut in the amount of $44,285, this having been previously approved by the City Council. Mayor, just a point of order. Um, yes. Just said I will be recusing myself from the motion and vote just to avoid the appearance of conflict, even though I don't think there's a direct one, just to be on the safe side. Okay. Yeah. All right, great. No, I appreciate that. Um, and just for further ratification, the purchase is actually coming from the vehicle replacement account. This is part of the um, vehicle plan. Um, do I have that motion? So moved. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Spino. Second. And second by Commissioner Benedetto. And are there questions? Emil is here to answer any questions you may have. I just have a quick question. It's equivalent um, purchase. Is there a $6,000 difference? MHQ it's, to Litchfield Ford. MHQ and uh, Litchfield, yes, for $6,000. It's for the same, same vehicle. Same exact vehicle, yes. It was that much more, huh? Yes. 
Wow. Actually, we're saving eleven thousand dollars because it was budgeted for fifty-five. All right. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion. Uh, and for the record, the abstention goes to uh, Commissioner Cutswell. Uh, item six, I'll entertain a motion to accept Police Chief Baldwin's report for July 2023. So moved. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Benedetto, second by Commissioner Spino. Questions or comments on the report? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item seven, I'll entertain a motion to accept Fire Chief Borden's report for July 2023. So moved. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Benedetto. Second by Commissioner McLeod. Questions or comments on this report? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item eight, I'll entertain a motion to accept the EMS provider activity report for July, 2023. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Benedetto. Second, Second by Commissioner Spino. Uh, questions or comments? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Item nine, I'll entertain a motion to consider business by the volunteer fire departments. So moved. Second. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Benedetto. Second by Commissioner Coxwell. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And is Chief bad? Is that um, Todd Fader? Or is that one of our volunteer fire departments? I don't think we have any of our volunteer fire departments online, do we? Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, I think that's I think that's from our uh, board of trustees meeting. Uh, seeing nobody from the volunteer fire departments here this evening, we'll. Skip that and go into item 10. I'll entertain a motion to consider business by the department heads. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Benedetto. Second. Second by Commissioner Spino. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We'll first go to Chief Baldwin. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, I just want to introduce a new member to our agency. Um, Officer Curtin is not the new member, but uh, his partner there, Drago, um, is a canine that uh, this board and the city council and the city supported in purchasing. Uh, we were able to pick up that um, canine yesterday uh, in New York. Um, Dave, bring, bring him around. Um, I'll have Dave uh, speak on um, the type of uh, canine that it is. It's a mix. It's a lab, it's not a lab. It's a shepherd mix. Um, and we um, picked it up out, out of New York yesterday. Uh, Officer Curtin starts his canine training on Monday, um, September 11th with the state police canine unit. He will be, this will be our second uh, second dog for the department, absent our third um, therapy dog. Gonna be busy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go ranch. Sure I'm gonna smell the joint. Yeah. Could you stand up, please? <laughs> and empty your pockets. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you can go to the podium, just explain a little bit. Some Boston. <laughs> Okay, so as the chief said, this is our new canine Drago. He is 75% uh, shepherd, as I'm sure you could see, but he's actually got a bit of Malinois on him. The remaining amount is Malinois, which gives him this crazy work drive like you wouldn't believe. He, uh, when it's go time, he's a completely different person. But I've been bringing him around for the last couple of days, driving with him, just so we can bond a bit before we get started working together. <laughs> before we get started working together, and also I'm trying to socialize him as much as possible because I don't want him to be one of these guys that you can't even let him out of the car. I'd like him to have some involvement with our community and with our coworkers as well. So, you know, please feel free to come up and say hi whenever you see me. Cause again, that's, that's my real intent with him is to have him really, really dual purpose and uh, a member of a community and a member of a department. Right. Great. 
and he was born in Germany, right? Yes, he was born in Germany and imported fairly recently. I'm work, still working on a passport, but <laughs> hopefully I get it eventually. <laughs> he is 16 months, 16 months. He's which, illegal, right? Yeah. yeah. So initially I was thinking about, about changing the name, but at 16 months, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with it. And plus, Drago's got a nice little ring to it, and he fits in with the rest of us. All right. <laughs> Any questions from anybody? No, good luck. No, congratulations. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. A good recruit, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, our our plan is is that uh, once uh, he is trained as a patrol dog, um, we he will also be cross trained in uh, narcotics uh, detection as well. Um, so um, uh, we're looking forward to having him on board. Uh, canine Pharaoh is our other canine, as uh, you have seen him. He's uh, working the midnight shift. Um, this uh, this canine, we anticipate to work the evening shift. And plus, we have Addison, and you've all uh, met Addison as well, our uh, therapy dog. Um, on September 25th is our PAL, is the annual PAL golf tournament um, that's taking place. Also, on Friday, the 29th of September, is our PAL car show that we had initially scheduled in the summertime, um, but was postponed due to uh, uh, weather related issues. Uh, in, during the month of August, we've had two resignations. Um, we have uh, one individual left to go to Middletown PD and another individual left uh, just to um, went into the private practice, uh, um, just uh, got out of law enforcement altogether. We have two expected to graduate on October 6th from the Meriden Academy and our other two that are in the Academy are expected to graduate on April 15th. Uh, we had an interview earlier this month, uh, the last, earlier in August. Uh, the last, uh, it, uh, the interviews were seven uh, applicants came through uh, there were four conditional offers, and as things are going now, we do the backgrounds where we may get one out of those, uh, possibly two. Also, uh, Sergeant Baldus uh, of our traffic division has um, initiated a online ticket payment system, um, which is uh, we're getting up with the, the, the modern times, so people will now be able to pay uh, any uh, tickets online. Uh, and this goes way back uh, for past uh, tickets that uh, have been issued um, uh, several years ago, for, as a matter of fact. So uh, they can get it on our Facebook account and also on our online account as well. Um, it's uh, part of the parkingapp.com is where it, uh, it can be located. And then uh, you choose either Park Mobile or Passport. There's a QR code that's also on the, uh, on the uh, app that uh, you can scan and choose uh, to be able to pay, uh, pay parking tickets. Uh, from an emergency management perspective, um, we launched a new website in uh, August. Uh, I encourage you to uh, take a look at it. A lot of information on that website. Uh, emergency management related issues will now be coming through that website. Also, I spoke to uh, Torrington Area Health Director Rob Rubo um, last week. I uh, spoke to him about um, COVID cases. Uh, COVID is starting to creep up, but not um, in a, a significant manner. Um, he's indicated that the COVID cases, uh, the variant that is in place now is a relatively mild variant. Um, there uh, has been a couple of hospitalizations, but nothing as uh, significant as uh, COVID incidences in the past. Uh, I asked him if he anticipates any type of lockdown or mandates coming up. And at this point, he doesn't feel as though it's going to uh, raise to that level. Um, so the only caution here is, is that um, as we enter into the fall season, winter season, um, that uh, we just uh, be cognizant of the fact that COVID cases are on the ride, rise and also that we're going into flu season right now. So uh, flu shots, uh, flu clinics are going to be uh, upcoming and uh, it's encouraged uh, that everybody gets their flu shot. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Chief. Any questions for the Chief? All right, Deputy Chief. Anything this evening? Just one thing about the, the new parking thing. We're going to be tied in with DMV and all that now. So if you have some. Yeah, there we go. So we're going to be tied in with DMV and with this new program. So I know that uh, over the years we've had significant amounts of uh, outstanding parking tickets. Now, once they're over $100, it will automatically go to DMV and it'll affect the vehicle registrations. Thank you. Questions. All right, Chief Borden. I have no report. Chief, Deputy Chief. All set. Anything from Trinity this evening? No. All right. 
And we'll move into item number 11. I'll entertain a motion to consider business by the mayor and members of the Board of Public Safety. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Benedetto. Second. And second by Commissioner McLeod. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We'll go to, starting from my left, anything this evening, Commissioner Battle? No. Commissioner McLeod? Commissioner Cuxville? Good evening, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Benedetto? Um, I just have one thing. Um, Chief, I talked to traffic, uh, Baldus, um, traffic officer Baldus, on Winston Road, then coming out of um, the rocker uh, quarry there on Winston Road, and the dirt in the road. And he says that it's not a liability. Who do who do people call about that issue? Uh, that's a, that's Route 800, so that's a state road maintained by the state as far as um, any type of debris or snow removal or that type of thing. So DOT would probably be the DOT. Uh, people to be contacted. Okay. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you. you. Commissioner McLeod, uh, sorry, McElroy. And Commissioner Spino. I have nothing. I, the only thing that I would add is um, prior to this meeting this evening, um, late this afternoon, we had uh, a formal execution of the MOU with the Army Pays Program. Uh, thank you to Commissioner um, Spino and Commissioner Battle. They were able to attend. Um, this is a great opportunity for us as a community, uh, not only to partner with the Army in um, helping to find um, work opportunities for our service men and women after they uh, retire from service, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for us to tap into those resources. You know, when we talk about searching for that high caliber candidate. So um, I'm pretty excited about the opportunities here. Um, I, I will say that the, um, uh, the presenters took um, great pains to acknowledge all of the veterans in the room uh, and particularly, they um, wanted to acknowledge the work of um, Officer Santiago um, for helping to bring that MOU to fruition for the city. So we have a lot of work to go do going forward, but I feel confident between uh, Officer Santiago and our HR department. Um, and this, by the way, is not just a program to help us with recruitment for police and fire, um, but also for other city departments, including uh, Board of Education. Oh, great opportunities. Um, so with that said, uh, close my agenda too soon. If there are no other questions or comments and no further business before the board, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank Second. you, Commissioner Benedetto. Second, Commissioner Spino. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you.